The second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs intensifies as the Florida Panthers and the Dallas Stars take leads in their series while the Carolina Hurricanes stay alive. We've got all that and a lot more on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Gil Martin here and welcome to the Monday edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone who makes Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you can get new episodes as soon as they drop. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show a very happy, excited Armando Velez, the host of Locked On Florida Panthers. And Armando, they're up three to one in the series now, getting a big win in Boston. Talk to me about this comeback win. What was the key? I mean, the key for the Florida Panthers was still just to stick to their own game because, I mean, even when the Panthers were down to nothing, I mean, the Panthers were still controlling play. There's a few instances where Tarasenko went on a breakaway and it was stopped by Jeremy Swayman. Mason Lori had a batted uh, puck that almost went into their own net. And for, for the Panthers, even, even they had the territorial advantage after the first period, the second period, and even the TNT crew uh, was talking about how if, if the, if the Boston Bruins don't defend uh, the blue line better or on the outside that the Panthers are going to come in waves uh, for, for them. And the Panthers were either way, but they were gonna they were gonna convert on on coming in from from those waves for for the Panthers. I mean, you think about how the Panthers. I mean, they went they had an offer in the regular season against the Boston Bruins. They got swept by them in the regular season. It didn't even register a power play goal in game one. And I mean, now it's six in the last three games. Alexander Barkov has taken over the series for the Panthers. I mean, it's really showing for the Panthers too how much deeper they are at center. Yeah, there was no Brad Marchand tonight. Uh, for the Boston Bruins, but I mean, you're having uh, you're having uh, Pavel Zaka shift from the left wing back to center to third line wing, and I mean the the line that really beat you for the Florida Panthers on on Sunday was the uh, Denon Hyman, uh, Coyle, Trent Frederick line, and Frederick was talking about uh, about going after the Panthers' his best players after that hit from Bennett on Marshan uh, back in Game Three, and I mean the they tried to provoke the Panthers. Pat Maroon was one of them. Uh, Charlie McAvoy with an open ice hit on Sam Reinhart, Jeremy Swayman on Matthew Kachuk, and then him saying, come here uh, with his glove after. I mean, but the Panthers didn't bite. They they re- were really composed. Uh, and it, and it really starts with the head coach and Paul Maurice. I, I mean, Sergey Borowski hasn't, say percentage won't say the story, but um, very big timely saves. And especially at the end where it was through traffic on the six on four, Barkov clears the puck and it doesn't allow them zone time. The Panthers are just winning board battles winning key face-offs in, on special teams. And, I mean, the Bruins have shot themselves in the foot. I mean, two interferences, one one with away from the puck on um, Hampus Lenone on OEL and then Morgan Geeky bumping into Sergey Bobrovsky, not not knowing where he is on the ice, too. I mean, it's, you're giving it, – it's not even about if the Panthers score on the power play, but just taking um, the, the, the puck being on the other side of the ice, and that's taking away any opportunities that the Panthers – have had on on Bob. He's been protected really well. The story last year, around this time last year, when the Panthers were making their run to the Stanley Cup final, was Sergey Bobrovsky going nuclear. It's not. It's 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 not necessarily the opposite, but it's the Panthers' blue line and and their depth all up and down the lineup. And after a bad game one by Gustav Forsling and Aaron Ekblad, they've definitely responded with how well they've controlled gaps. They're taking away the backdoor feeds from the Boston Bruins on special teams. I mean, this is this is a Panthers penalty kill who went into the postseason number one on, on the road and killing and in kill percentage too. So it's great to see for the cats. A little bit of controversy at the end of this game. Talk to me about what happened and, and your view of it. Yeah, uh, I will admit uh, the Panthers did. Um, I, at first I did not think that I thought that was going to be reversed. Uh, Jim Montgomery after the game spoke about how, with the push that Sam Bennett had on Charlie Coral, he took away his positioning for him to have to backhand it out. But based on the peripherals of, of wearing a bucket and with that buck puck bouncing, I don't know if uh, Charlie Coyle would have actually uh, gotten his uh, his uh, his blade on it too. So I'm not I'm not quite sure if that that would have cleared. I thought I thought it would have been a goal anyway, 
but the TNT broadcast was discussing more about how if the call was initially called a cross check to the back of coil that 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 could have been the difference based on the rule but i i was surprised but hey uh for the florida panthers sake uh, you're not complaining i mean yeah um, and and hey the florida panthers have had had a friendly whistle in game three where where aaron ekblad uh was actually held uh actually had a hold but uh they crashed uh, into a net calling goalie interference for the boston bruins too and it's been a lot of unforced errors for the Boston Bruins in this series. I mean, two straight games with the too many men on the ice, a failed challenge, of, even though I just mentioned that I was surprised there. So it's been a lot of those uh, unforced errors by the by the Boston Bruins. I mean, I mean, for 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 the Panthers, I mean, center depth has been the thing for for them. I mean, Barkoff, Bennett coming back too. Uh, and and th- here's the thing, Gil. Uh, Sam Bennett, before getting hurt in Game Two against the Lightning, had two two points uh, uh, right before getting hurt, and now he comes back and he gets two points of his own uh, <laughs> since he's returned. I mean, it's brought so much balance to the lineup. It's even to the point where you're questioning, um, you're not questioning, but you have two heroes from last year's postseason in Nick Cousins with the Game Five winner in Toronto last year. He's a scratch. Ryan Lombard, who got sick in the middle of the first round, he gets a big goal in game four against the Carolina Hurricanes in, in last year's Eastern Conference Finals, and they're not even part of the lineup. Josh Mahura, the same thing, someone who played all 82 games in all post um all of the postseason games, too. The Panthers are just deeper this year. And I mean, with, with the lessons they learned from the Stanley Cup final as far as size, uh, it, it's really it's really come to uh fruition. It's uh it, they're enjoying currently the fruits of their labor. This game, game four, I mean, it's a one goal win, but the shots on goal were so one sided in favor of the Panthers. Talk to me about Jeremy Swayman and did he keep Boston in this game? Absolutely. I mean, the, the Panthers had a breakaway with, uh, like I said, uh, breakaway Tarasenko earlier on a great stretch pass from Ekblad. And then the Lori almost batted it in his own net. I mean, all three goals for the Panthers on Sunday were. Be, where well not not all three two of the three uh were because the panthers got into that blue paint uh sasha barkoff weaving through the defense after kyle pozo uh kept the puck in the zone i mean sam reinhardt did not finish this game he was bleeding and had a bucket full of blood uh near the near the crease too and and kyle pozo who the reasoning behind that uh to put pozo there uh was because he's a right-handed shot so keeping um keep for, but also him uh, topping it back to Barkov and then him weaving through the defense. You could argue that Boston should have used more body instead of stick for a man that big in Barkov for him to get it past the blocker, but also Bennett crashing the net. Uh, and then the first one by Lundell, it was because uh, the Panthers dumped it in and then, uh, and then Swayman was screened by his own guy too. And that's the thing for the Panthers. I mean, game one, they struggled uh, with that. And I was thinking even after game one, how the heck are the Panthers going to get through Swayman if he's seeing pucks this clearly? And man, have they adjusted? I mean, uh, and three straight games with a power play goal for for the Cats uh, too. I, I mean, it's it's everything for the Panthers as far as winning uh, winning battles along uh, along the walls uh, and 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 get and also for the power play, the goals that they scored. It's not that one set play where they're getting it down below to Kachuk and then back in the bumper position to Reinhardt. They're 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 allowing the Boston Bruins PK guys to get onto the strong side so that they can dish it cross ice and to get an open lane uh, to J- Jeremy Swayman too, and it, he there he's not the reason why the Boston Bruins are uh, losing this series. And also, you made uh, they've made Hampus Lindholm and uh, Charlie McAvoy look like humans. That's supposed to be a top four for the Boston Bruins, and they've made them they've made them uh, not not look like a top four um, of top four players for for them. So what is the key to closing out this series and not letting Boston back in? I mean, it's going to it's going to come down to how you protect the middle of the ice too. One, once again for for the Panthers, it's been it's been a thing that has been uh in in their favor uh all 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 throughout the postseason. I mean, last year they shut down Austin Matthews, uh Mitch Marner for the most part and William Nylander. First round this year you shut down Nikita Kucherov and and Braden Point. Um, Steven Samkos was one that you were allowed uh, to beat you on the power play too. And, and for the, and for the Panthers, uh, even in game one, it was a lot of depth scores uh, for the Boston Bruins who were getting on the board. Pasternak was not, was not, he wasn't, he wasn't a, he wasn't a factor statistically, but he was a factor of, of, of creating turnovers for the Panthers in game one and getting it to those other guys too. 
But even even when he gets a goal on on in game four, I mean, it's it's still not enough for the Florida Panthers to win. Yeah, they Brad Marchand is not in the, in the lineup for uh, the the Bruins heart and soul uh, for for them at least this current edition of the of the Bruins. But I mean, the Panthers have them uh, where where they they want them. Uh, the the Bruins tried to get a little rough, uh, and and the Panthers were just composed the whole time. Pat Maroon. Uh, was trying to bait Bennett into fighting, but Bennett's not going to fight a fourth liner. They know that if both go to five minutes for fighting, it, it favors the it favors the Boston Bruins over over the Panthers in that situation as far as uh, your five on five play too. So I mean, it's it's just really about your centers being healthy and and get and protecting that middle and just uh, puck support is going to be key for when they're entering the zone and and the Panthers. It, it's just really hard for the Boston Bruins to just get anything going on, on a cycle in 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 the cat's end all right armando why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media they can find me personally on x at monoman 12 they um where they could see me tweet uh, about about the panthers and and hope ho- hopefully for me i i can delay my baseball tweets until late june so i'm hoping to just the hockey tweets from now until until then um especially with the state of the baseball team down in south florida but also they could follow the show account on x at lo underscore fla panthers and on instagram and they can fo- and they could also follow locked on panthers on youtube where we just passed the 800 subscription mark so south florida hockey uh is is on the rise and also their their echl affiliate Florida everblades are back in the eastern conference final after defeating the orlando solar bears in five games All right. Armando, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you, as always, Gil. Today's episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. It's the country's leading online insurance marketplace. And Policy Genius saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies, and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Easily compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Check life insurance off your to do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on NHL or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on NHL, policygenius.com slash locked on NHL. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Dallas Stars, Joey Erickson. And uh, Joey, an exciting Game three, the Stars up now two games to one. Big road win. What what was the key to victory in game three for the Stars? Yeah, I, I thought Dallas did a wonderful job of surviving uh, in Avalanche. <laughs> uh, no, no pun intended there. Well, it, it was it was sort of intended, but I, I thought they did a, a fantastic job of just kind of hanging in there. And, and I think the Stars went into game three with the mindset uh, of hey, we have to force Colorado to get through five white sweaters to get to the front of our net and and defend really really hard because of course in games one and two Colorado got uh, a, a little spark in the third period and then it snowballed into something uh, a lot more than Dallas uh, wanted it to uh, and against Vegas they were so so defensively stout against the Golden Knights and really had no problems closing out the four wins they had in that series. And then you get to games one and two, and it is a more difficult task, I think, with Colorado just having the best offense in the NHL throughout the regular season. So uh, you have to find ways to to limit Nathan McKinnon and McCarr, which is really, really hard to do. But uh, if you can force Colorado to go through five guys before they get to Jake Ottinger, um, then then good things can happen for you. And I think Dallas did a phenomenal job of being really, really comfortable in their defensive posture. And when Colorado broke down, 
even if it was for only a moment, the Stars capitalized and they scored. And once again, they play from ahead, and, and that is huge. The more they can play without trailing, uh, I think it, it is going to bode well for the Stars. They haven't trailed in the series. Uh, of course, they lost an OT, but they, they haven't trailed in the series uh, yet. Uh, the first period was Really, really important with Jake Ottinger just being fantastic in the first 20. The Stars had to kill off three penalties. And um, if you can keep uh, their special teams off the board, good things will happen. And Dallas, they just they scored just enough. And, and that third period was, was clinical. One of the, the best defensive performance we've seen throughout the postseason. And that's what Pete DeBoer is hoping for moving forward in this series because they hadn't won a third period yet. That was a huge third period on the road. Uh, Mandalas continues to be a, a really good road team. They were the best, of course, throughout the, the NHL in the uh, regular season, and they're now 3-1 and one so, so far in the first two series. So good things ahead. You have the series um, series lead, and well, you have a chance to, to kind of go for the next, so to speak, if, if you take game four. Kale McCarr, obviously one of the more talented, game-changing players mm -hmm. in the game right now. What is the Stars' approach to trying to limit his effectiveness in this series? Well, I, I think for, for the most part, it's just try to keep him on the outside, keep him perimeter. I, I thought they did a, a really good job in game three of, of forcing him to the outside. And, and another thing uh, that, that Dallas did, especially against uh, you know some of the, the bigger names for Colorado, you're going to see a lot of Chris Tanev and a lot of Essel and Dell, the best defensive pairing for Dallas. And anytime they make one fumble, they have one mishandle, they cough it up, they are sending someone to them automatically. You cannot give them time and space, of course. I, I thought the Stars did an excellent job of pressuring their defense. And uh, in the neutral zone specifically, they're not allowing McCarr uh, and, let's say, Samuel Gerrard to just cruise through the, between the blue lines and, and, and be creative off the rush. They really forced Colorado to dump pucks in, which is not really their type of game. They don't want to do that. They want to use their speed and, and get wide um, and create plays that way. But they forced Colorado to have to throw a lot of pucks in deep and, and have to forecheck. And the Stars did a much better job um, uh, of quelling that forecheck by just being really, really strong on pucks in the corners. Uh, and McCarr's going to get his looks. <laughs> he's just he's just that talented. But, yeah, I, I think that the more they pressure him and, and stay on top of him, and um, I even saw it moments in Game 3 against McKinnon specifically, um, if, if he turned, I mean, they would send another guy just to try to go attack him and, and just get the puck off his stick. Make someone else beat you, but besides number number eight, uh, that's McCarr's number, right? I can forget. He's a, he's a flash. Oh so, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> along with McKinnon in twenty. Try to make someone else beat you because what the stars do have sort of advantages is depth. Um, I, I think Colorado's the much more talented, maybe much more superstar revolving team, but Dallas has better depth. I, th I think they have probably the best depth out of the remaining teams, maybe besides a, a New York. So um, they have to use that to their advantage. And if you can keep those guys off the board, good things will happen. Uh, I think McCarr's without a point in, in um, games uh, two and three now. Um, and I think when he scores, they're like 22 and seven in the both season. They're, they're pretty much unbeatable. Um, and, and, he, and he had three points in the first game. Um, he, he, he made his impact. So Dallas is doing a great job against him. It's really hard to do, but <laughs> if you keep him off the score sheet, good things will happen. Talk to me about Jake Ottinger, what he's meant to this team all year and what he's meant in this series so far. Yeah, it, it was a, it was an up and down year. He he, he wasn't the, the Jake Ottinger a lot of Stars fans wanted to see. And I think the, the conversation revolving around him can uh, be a little bit divisive. It seems you're either really for him or you think he's a fraud. And look, Jake Ottinger is a franchise goaltender. I don't think anybody can argue that. Maybe he's not top five or elite. Maybe he's not to the Shesterkin or Hellenbeck level, but I think he's damn near it. And time and time again, when the stars need him most, he usually shows up really, really big. And if you go back since game two um, of that first round against Vegas, he's six and three a 930 save percentage and a 1.91 goals against average. So 
he's he's doing very very well you know and he's not giving up a, a ton of soft goals um there hasn't been really a head scratcher in the series of course you want him to stop everything but <laughs> it, it's really hard and and maybe what what works against him sometimes is when he he burst onto the scene in that series against Calgary where it was just I mean you couldn't beat him it was unbelievable how many how many saves he made and I think sometimes our expectations are that and that's just, that's not possible. Like <laughs> he's a human. He's not going to live up to that standard every single time, but damn, when you need him most game seven against Vegas, first two periods against Colorado here the other day, he's fantastic. And he wasn't great at the, at home all year. Um, statistically, he's like top eight um, on the road this season. And it's really a huge reason why Dallas has been successful on the road you usually need good goaltending and um, he plays great on the road so I mean he's going to be the key and 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 that's kind of a cop-out answer in a lot of ways like your goal is always important <laughs> um the, the, you have to have great net minding and the stars are getting it which is um, a great sign because it was a little bumpy throughout the year but he's really cleaned it up here um and, and hopefully that lasts talk to me about special teams in this series and how important that's going to be the rest of the way yeah, special teams change the complexion of a lot of games. And if you look at game two specifically, Colorado shot themselves in the foot a lot. I think two bench miners in that one. They had a delay a game. So that's six minutes right there, penalty minutes where um, it's really unforced errors in a lot of way. And Dallas, you know, struck a couple of times there. They get a shorthanded goal from Sagan to, to make it 4 nothing, And and that's pretty much all she wrote. I know <laughs> Colorado made it really, really intriguing uh, d down the stretch, but Dallas was was able to hold on. Um, the, their PK has been a lot better. And, and as I alluded to earlier, uh, the Stars are being a much more aggressive uh, against the Colorado power play. They're pressuring them high. They're not letting them get settled and, and, and spread out and create plays because um, if you allow them to, to get comfortable, they're going to make you pay, a along with great shot blocking. I mean, Tan have stopped a goal yesterday on a, on a McKinnon one-timer. So um, they've been really, really good in that aspect. They killed the last uh, six power plays um, from Colorado. And if you can keep if you can keep them off the board and special teams, good, good things are, are, are going to happen too. Um, power plays are big, but I, I think the penalty kill is even more important for, for Dallas because it, it hasn't been, um, I would say, as surefire as as you would hope uh, as hope to be. Um, but th but they've been excellent here in the last few games, and I think if they can keep Colorado off the board in that aspect, frustration can start to build up throughout a series because. I mean, Colorado beat the brakes off of Winnipeg in the first mm -hmm. round. Uh, so if you can keep them to, you know, two uh, two goals a night and, and maybe it's just five on five goals, I think that bodes bodes well for Dallas. And, and hopefully you get some of their stars that are, are holding the stick a, a bit too tight and um, that can help your cause. All right, Joey, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? Absolutely. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts, of course. Uh, Locked on Stars. You can follow Locked on Stars at Twitter, um, or uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well at uh, JoeyTheJet19, throwing stuff out every day and uh, enjoying the postseason in, in general. It's been great. <laughs> All right, Joey, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Carolina Hurricanes, Zachary Martin. And uh, Zach, a big win for the Canes over the weekend to stay alive. What was the difference 
in game four compared to the first three games? Well, I would say you look at just how game four was, you know, the Hurricanes finally scored on the power play, you know, for, you know, hey, 17 times the charm and don't say otherwise, but uh, yeah, no, it's just, you know, they got the one that was really needed from Brady Shea, his first of the playoffs actually, which is good. So former X Ranger kind of getting you that game winner very, very late into the third period. And you know, that was kind of the difference. The fact that, you know, you saw the whole series and the Rangers were at that point five nothing. You know, a lot of their goals are coming on special teams. That's kind of what's been the thing for the whole series is whoever's capitalizing on the special teams opportunities usually has won the game. And the Hurricanes haven't been able to do that on the power play. They finally get it, they finally get that one that they need, and that was the game winner. And you know, that's the big thing that really helped them out. And even then, too, like, yeah, they got a big lead in the first period up three one after the first 20 minutes. And then yeah, the Rangers clawed back in it, but just kind of being able to stick to their game and, you know, not taking too many penalties. Like the, the Hurricanes only have one penalty the entire game, which is huge for the fact that you look at games two and three, you're looking at four, almost four game. Now you get one. So it, it's kind of helped the fact that it was a lot more five-on-five five play because a lot of people have been talking about the Hurricanes are more five-on-five five team, and that's kind of what we saw in game four. It was more of, all right, the Hurricanes, you know, we're usually we're allowed to show their muscle a little bit and show that they are a good five-on-five five team. That's – one of the big things, but I say just finally capitalizing on the special teams us which was the game winner made a big difference in keeping the series alive. Yeah, it's still a huge mountain to climb because now you're still talking two more elimination games before you even get to game seven. One day at a time, one game at a time at this point for the Hurricanes. We know the Hurricanes were outstanding both on the power play and the penalty kill throughout the regular season. It was a big factor in their win over the Islanders in the first round. What have the Rangers been doing to disrupt that power play for the Carolina Hurricanes? Keeping them in the perimeter. It's the thing that, like you saw in, I wouldn't even, if you want to go even back to five on five real quick, Steph Nason got a goal and it was net front. Bray Shea's goal that he scored on, it was a Seth Jarvis screen right in front of Shesterkin, and that's how he was able to score his goal. So, what the Rangers have basically done this entire series to hold the Hurricanes up until that point, 0 for 16, is just keeping them at the perimeter, not really giving them a lot of chances to go on the inside. If you're talking about the Rangers, it's a team where you have to go inside. You have to crash the net, you know, block Shesterkin's eyes. Because if, you if you're not screening Shesterkin, he's going to see every shot that comes at him. And that's why you see the Hurricanes are, as you know, Gil, a high-volume shooting team. But, you know, and we see from the Rangers. Rangers are quality over quantity, and the Rangers and the Hurricanes right now have been quality have been quantity more than anything else. When that's the Hurricanes are, they are a high volume shooting team. But if you're not screening the goalie or getting a guy in front of the net, you're not really doing a whole lot. So that's what the Rangers have been doing. Keep him out to the perimeter and not really getting them to go inside to you know get rebounds, screens, and you know, getting those as we all call it, playoff goals, those greasy goals right in front of the net. And like Artemi Panarin in overtime in game three, what was his goal? Right in front of the crease that he just deflected it in. you got to get those playoff goals. And the Hurricanes, unfortunately, right now weren't doing it on the power play, but Seth Jarvis gets that screen, Bray Shea scores from the point, and there you go. There's your power play goal because net front presence is mainly the big thing. So that's what the Hurricanes need to do is just keep getting guys in front of the net and start getting Risha Sturkin's eyesight. That's all you really got to do at this point to keep it going. Talk to me about the goaltending situation going forward. I mean, Frederick Anderson didn't play poorly early on in the series, but he wasn't as good as he was, obviously, late in the regular season and in the first round. How do you see Rod Brindamore handling the goalie situation going forward? Yeah, because you see through the regular season, him and Peter Kachakov were doing a lot of, you know, they were just flip-flopping through most of the regular season, the last 20 games of the year until, you know, the last game of the season where they went with Spencer Martin because at that point, second was locked up. It wasn't really that big of a deal to go with the regulars and stuff like that, but you go throughout the entire playoff. Up until game three, it was all Freddie Anderson right from the start, and, you know, then Rod Burnham warned them, said, you know, the plan was just to give him rest for game three and go back to him for game four, and you look at game four, it wasn't the greatest game from him. He still made big save when big saves when necessary, but there were a couple goals that you would wish he would get back. And, and it's just one of those things where you know maybe just playing all those games is finally catching up to Freddie, and maybe it's time to go to Peter. And honestly, I thought Peter did Peter Kachekov did good in Game Three. It's just one of those things where the special teams didn't really help out, and it came to an overtime goal for Terry Panarin, and just the kind of the defense not you know kind of not doing what they needed to do in the power play. We're still struggling at that time. So if you're going forward, I'd maybe start looking at giving Peter Kachekov more time. Like I said, 
he he played great in game three, all things considered. You know, what can you do with a, a deflected shot from Panarin in overtime? Like that's nothing really you could put on him. You know, Frederick Harris has been playing okay to start the playoffs and even the start of the series, but I don't know. It's one of those things where you kind of start maybe it's time to go back to your backup who's been really good. And the fact that game three was his first game in over three weeks. If I, if I was Rod Brandon Moore, and of course, you know, no one knows what's going on in the mind of, you know, a guy like Rod, but I would probably start considering maybe looking at Peter Kachak up a little bit more to give him some more time on the ice and, you know, let him see, you know, what he can do and stuff like that. I mean, like I said, Frey's been fine, but maybe it's kind of time to give the other guy a little bit more looks to than just one game, just because you gave Frederick Anderson rest. You mentioned Rod Brindamore, questions about his future in Carolina. What have you heard? What is the latest? And do you think he's back next season, regardless of the outcome of this playoff series and this playoff run? I think where regardless of how the playoff run goes, I don't see Rod Brindamore going anywhere. Like Don Waddell said it after the first, you know, after the first round against the New York Islanders, they've asked him at press conferences that him and Rod have been talking every day. You know, Don Waddell feels really good. That a deal will get done. It's just, you know, as he said, he said in his quotes, it's, you know, two parties have to talk about it and stuff like that. And the, and the one thing that, you know, just like last time Red Burnamore's contract came up was making sure his assistant coach got taken care of, you know, Tim Gleason, Jeff Daniels and all that. And that's probably what the same thing is, too. I've seen reports of like Seattle has been thinking about trying to go after him at some point. I know there was an article that came out recently. I think it was from like the hockey writers or something that were talking about maybe Toronto was going to look at Rod Burnamore, but I'm still at the. I'm still from what I'm hearing. It, they're going to try to get this deal done because if you're, you know, Don Waddell or Tom Dunn and stuff like that, you don't get rid of one of the best coaches in franchise history. Yes, Corey, you know, Laviolette did win a cup for the Hurricanes and stuff like that. But other than that one year, it's been it was all right with him. You know, Paul Burris went there a couple times. But if you're looking at a more consistent coach that the Hurricanes have had, Rod Burnham has taken this team to six straight playoff appearances, six straight first round wins for the team. You don't really, you don't want to give up a coach like that. And a lot of guys come to Carolina because of Rod Brandon Moore. So I don't really see him leaving. I think it'd be a very big mistake if the Hurricanes let him walk. So I think right now it's just, they're focused on the playoffs right now. And that's how Rod is like the contract will get done. I know a lot of people keep bringing it up because the fact that it's like, it might be a distraction. I don't see it as a distraction. It's about taking care of business first, and that's going to win a cup. Contract will come after that and stuff. So I don't really see him leaving. I think he's going to be a Carolina Hurricane. It's just probably figuring out some really small details behind the scenes and, you know, just kind of focusing on the playoffs right now because that's the ultimate goal. Contracts will, you know, they'll happen, but not every opportunity you get a chance to go get a Stanley Cup right now. You mentioned go getting a Stanley Cup. What are the keys to getting back into this series? Obviously, as you said, one game at a time. Yeah, that's that's all really it is. And Rod Brandon Moore said at the beginning of the season too, it's getting plus one percent every day better. And it's just you got to take one game at a time and one day at a time, really. And that's what the, and Jordan Stahl said at Bray Shea, Jordan Martin, all those guys are saying it. Yeah, you can't win a series in one game, but you know you can just go one day at a time. Go be one and zero. And I know that's what Bray Shea said. You go into that game day, you go one and zero. You move on to the next one. You go one and zero that next day. And that's what the Hurricanes need to do. It's it's a tough, you know. Only four teams in the under-plus history of the NHL have come back from a 3-0 deficit. The last one to do was the 2014 LA Kings. You know, and we all saw what they did. So it's just one of those things where it's you you can't you you got to take one game at a time, one period at a time, and just keep getting one and zero better every day, and just keep getting that plus one percent better every single day. And that's just kind of what the Hurricanes need to focus on is just take the momentum from Game Four, take it into Game Five uh, tonight against the Rangers in game five and you just win that one then you worry about hopefully Thursday for game six so that's what you just got to do is just take it one period at a time and go from there and just keep building on the momentum and took what worked in game four and supplant it into game five all right Zachary why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media yeah of course if you want to find the podcast it's lo underscore hurricanes on x if you want to look for me I am at one true Zach on X as well. And I have a link to in my bio where you can just find all my articles and where you can find locked on hurricanes and all that good stuff on that side of the, on things. All right. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you, Gil. Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 seven streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon fire TV and the free fire TV channels app locked on sports today is here for you. 24 seven. 
covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today, now available on the free Fire TV channels app. That's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On NHL podcast. I want to thank my guests, Zachary Martin of Locked On Hurricanes, Joey Erickson of Locked On Dallas Stars, and Armando Velez of Locked On Florida Panthers for joining me today. I'm Gil Martin. I host the Monday edition of Locked On NHL, and I co-host the Friday edition along with Rachel Donner. Don't forget, we're here on Locked On NHL every day, Monday through Friday, bringing you the biggest stories from around the National Hockey League. So make sure you join us for that. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. And thanks for watching and listening to the Locked On NHL podcast.